On episode 236 of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Katie Bowman and discuss her book, Aging Dynamically. You can find the full show notes for this episode at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 236. Have you decided you're ready to make a change? To reclaim your health and fitness, the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is here for you. I'm your host, Alan Meisner. I'm an NSAM certified personal trainer with a specialization in corrective exercise and fitness nutrition. Let me be your coach as you find your way on your health and fitness journey. All right, let's go. Spring has sprung. Are you ready for it? Surefire Results for Weight Loss is a 28-day program guaranteed to help you lose weight. Simple lifestyle changes. I'll be your accountability coach and a supportive Facebook group just for Surefire Results clients. You can find us at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash surefire. So come on down and join us today. Our guest today is a biomechanist who merges the science and a practical approach to help people heal. She is the host of Katie Says, an award-winning blog and podcast. She has written several books, including the best-selling Move Your DNA. I'd like for you to meet Katie Bowman. So, Katie, welcome to 40 Plus Fitness. Thank you for having me. When I got your book, it was kind of interesting because what I liked about it was not that you were looking at people, you know, maybe 40, 50 years old, but you really had uh, individuals that were kind of past that point. And I think a lot of us think, well, okay, there's there's no use for me. You know, I, I've never been an athlete. I've never done these things. But you, you know, working with those, particularly those four women, and I think they they brought a lot to the table themselves, just shows that you can, in fact, at any age, do something special if you're willing to put in the time and effort and have the right attitude. Yeah, and I I picked them specifically because I've been I've been teaching the movement as a way of preserving strength and mobility and maybe even cognition and and pleasure in your day-to-day life for a long time. But it's one thing when you are, you know, I started talking about this when I was in my 20s, you know, and I'm teaching people of all ages. And then now I'm 30 and then I'm 40. And still, I would say the general sentiment is, well, that's because you, you don't know what it's actually like, that that I know you think it works this way, but when you get to a certain age, it no longer works that way. And you know where movement can really bring about radical improvements to how you move, how you feel. And so I thought, well, what I have access to are hundreds, if not thousands of people that I've worked with for a long time. And there happens to be this group of four women who started with me in their late 60s, early 70s, and they've worked with me each for a decade. So I was like, well, how about them? Let's let's let them tell you, because it's easy, I would say, to discount it with, you know, the belief that you, you just don't really get better with age. You know, maybe that's wine, but not perhaps my knees or my hips. And I was like, well, here are four women who have not really done it a little bit. They've done it a lot. You know, they they really radically overhauled what I would say their movement diet or their movement profile and are better in their early 80s and late 70s than they were 10 years ago. And I think that that's impactful. I think it's a powerful statement because then it begins to shift your mind, I think, a little bit, which I think is necessary before you shift your body, the, re- the rest of your body. And so I typically, I'm working with individuals from the 40 to 60 age range, and I'm trying to help them avoid you know, getting to a point where they, they get there. But obviously, many of us aren't. And the funny thing is, I'll be having a conversation with someone who's in their 40s, and I'll say, the thing I want to work with you is I want to prevent you from falling when you're 80. And they kind of look at me like, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, you're telling me what your your dreams and your hopes and your aspirations. You want to live on this mountain in Tennessee. You want to be able to do these hikes that in some cases are going to be quite strenuous and difficult. It's not level. We're going to start working on fall prevention now. And they just kind of look at me. But after a little while of going through it, they start to understand what we're doing and how it's how it's improving their their lives and their health even now. So can we kind of talk a little bit about falls? Why why falls are so important to consider as we age and uh, what we can do about it? Well, I think that there's definitely a fear of falling. You know, there's these weak in, in our particular society where there's so much convenience and so much technology to really get us from point A to point B to bring things to us as we need them. We don't really think about the liability of a fall. But the fact of the matter is falls later in life 
they become, in some cases, almost impossible to recover from. You know, I think a broken hip, I believe, has uh, like statistically a one-year mortality from that point because it's very hard to recover becoming weight-bearing after having lost the integrity of your weight-bearing structures. And so I think that your ability to negotiate your landscape, whether it's the inside of your house or your yard or that hill in Tennessee is directly related to your ability to negotiate it safely, that you've got mobility and strength, suppleness, that you can stumble and recover, that you could even fall and recover, that the state of your body, should you fall, is more robust to deal with the forces of that particular fall. So you're talking about self-efficacy. You're talking about continuing to do the things that you want to do in your life, whether they are, you know, continue to work or continue to do large physical feats, like maybe you're hiking all the hikes in your area or you're, when you take vacations, you're traveling to beautiful natural environments that you want to do more than just drive through. You want to actually get out and physically experience, or maybe it's just hanging out with your family or your grandkids or your dog, you know, like you want to keep being able to do these things. And these are all physical experiences. And to be able to do them without that kind of background noise of like, man, I hope I don't fall. I hope I don't fall because that itself is a risk factor for falling. It's like we want to get people's physical competency up so that their mental game is strong, which then reinforces the physical competency. Because it's a it's interesting phenomenon, that fear of falling, where it can disrupt your actual physical adaptations because you start changing the way you move because you're afraid of some fall that hasn't happened yet. And I know that, you know, I guess as as we get through this, there's a lot of reasons why our body kind of gets to a point where it is easier to fall. But like you said, there's that aspect of, I just kind of have this, this fear. And so I'm reacting in a way that's very, very different than normal. And as, as a result, my gait gets smaller I'm not pushing myself to go to those places. In many cases, stop going to those places, which I I think is really a tragedy. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, we have, we're afraid of falling and then we engage in behavior that increases its risks, whether, and you know, like a real standard recommendation for people as they get older. And I've seen it over and over in magazines. I've seen it on government websites. I've seen it in health websites, which is start to remove the obstacles from your home, right? You know, uh, make sure that there's no, rugs, you know, I, my father's 90, almost 90 in six weeks. And, you know, people will come over and they'll say, you need to roll up all of these rugs. You need to anything that he could possibly trip over. We want to get rid of it. And it's like, well, I understand that sentiment, certainly. However, if you remove all of the obstacles in your life, with that goes the physical adaptations to dealing with them. So when you're constantly presented with this flat and level surface that you don't have to worry about, you lose your chops, you know, you lose your lumpy, bumpy chops. And then because you don't solely exist within your obstacle-free home, you put yourself at greater risk when you go over to someone else's home or when you want to go to the grocery store. You know, not the whole world is not obstacle-free. And so you train yourself over time through, I think we have a prevention as a mindset of get rid of the obstacles, where I would say we need to redefine prevention as stay strong enough to deal with the obstacles, that there's a, a physical training and it can be a controlled set of obstacles in an environment where you're aware that they're there, you know, to keep up your chops or your strength. And so I just, I think it's really interesting how a lot of our solutions towards safety tend to be packaged with move less. The move less is not, it's not explicit. It's always implicit, but it's kind of like, well, if you're afraid of falling, then just sit more, you know, and, and then slowly we reduce movement and then slowly we get weaker. And so when, as you're, you know, someone, it's interesting, I don't consider 50 year olds or 60 year olds to really be seniors. I mean, I know there's like government guidelines, but as far as gerontology research goes, those are still, you know, adults. They're not even really older adults, but the language written to those groups will often say, you know, you need to prep and, you know, and think about fall prevention where you're on the other hand going, well, we're going to approach fall prevention as your strength conditioning program, which I think is a radical idea that's certainly necessary. Yeah. And I thought that was really interesting, you know, as, as you're, as you're working with your clients and, and, you know, you're actually having them do obstacles. And, and it was interesting. You had one client uh, that you acknowledged. He, he actually practices falling. Yeah. He's actually a famous guy. He wasn't a client of mine. He himself had 
develop this huge falling program because he said, we're not prepared for falls. I mean, they scare us mentally because we don't even, we can't even imagine what they would be like. And he would just kind of fall onto his mattress every day, you know, super safe, just, you know, you're falling two feet onto a bunch of pillows, but that got him over what tends to happen when we fall, which is like what your arms extend and, and you're very stiff and you're tight. And then thus the forces increase from that fall because you can't really roll with it. If you ever take martial arts or have ever taken any of those classes, falling has its own technique, just like walking, just like sitting, just all, there's an alignment to falling, if you will. And, and if you stay practiced in it, if you do fall, you roll with it so much easier and you can decrease, you know, the impact of that fall. It becomes just another move. And a lot of people don't even recognize this in football practice. You'll, you'll see it from time to time. We actually, when I was a kid, in football, that's actually some of the things we we practiced. It wasn't so much we practiced, but we were going down and getting up and we were, you know, doing drills that were were teaching us just the skills of of being able to deal with with that and 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 not take the brunt of it if we didn't have to. But I just thought that was fascinating to actually practice. It's got me thinking with when I redo my gym, I might be working on some of these things, some of these concepts, because it's really interesting. Now, when you're working with someone on balance, you pretty much start from the foot up all the way through to the ribs. And I'd like to just, if you don't mind, take a little bit of time to kind of talk through each of those. The foot will probably take the longest amount. Right. But <laughs> <laughs> There's more joints there. There's a lot more there, which is kind of, I think, surprises a lot of people because they just think, okay, I can bend my toes. I can do a few things, but they don't recognize how dynamic the foot is intended to be. But you work all the way up to the ribs. If, if you could just do that for a minute here with us. Well, I definitely think that if, if anyone wanted to improve their whole body movement, whether it's balance or or general fitness, you want to look at your feet because I like throw the stat out a lot because I think it's powerful. 25% of the number of muscles and bones in your body are from the ankle down. Yet most people, even avid exercisers, people who are very fit conscious and, and movement conscious have never trained their feet. You know, usually the feet are actually confined and wrapped up and kind of disengaged from the bout of movement that you're doing. So I recommend that you start working with strengthening and mobilizing the feet. And that goes for the individual joints and muscles in the toes, but that the, there's also movement of the foot itself. We have this kind of narrative, like I have a high arch, I have a flat arch. It's like, well, the shape of your foot is created by the mobility and the strength of all of those joints in there. So like that's very malleable. The state of your feet is extremely malleable, certainly given how little attention it's been given historically. You know, like you put shoe on when you're five and you went to school and it's likely that you stopped running around barefoot after you were a kid. And so there's definitely a stepwise approach of like a, something for everyone to try right now would be, could you, can you spread your toes away from each other? If you, if you uh, look down at your hands and you spread your fingers away from each other, that, that abduction or that side that lateral movement or spreading your toes have the ability to do that too. They have all the parts, but just if I put a mitten on your hands and pushed all your fingers together, you've been practicing having your toes pressed together almost your entire life. So you can maybe do it in your shoes, depending on how narrow or wide they are, but you can certainly kick off your shoes and just look down at your feet. Can I spread my toes? And that already, if you're, if you're an engineer, have like an engineering background, you've increased your base of support simply by spreading the toes away from each other. You're you're improving your strength of your foot, but also a component of balance simply by having that movement available to you. And then can you lift just your big toe or are your feet so stiff that when you lift one toe, all the toes have to come together where there's this kind of clumpage or, you know, very gross motor programming instead of, you know, if you put your fingers on an imaginary piano and kind of think of playing the keys. You don't just bang both hands down. You want each finger to move individually. Your toes also can do that. So that's, those would be like super general exercises that everyone can start to do to improve the strength and base of support offered by your feet. And then you start moving up and you're like, okay, well, where are my hips? Like, do you tend to wear your hips way out in front of you? Do your hips enter the room? A brief moment before your heels do. So then I have people start playing with the position of their hips because if your hips are way out in front of you, you're essentially, you're already kind of falling. You're, you're in a more vulnerable position. So I would have people back their hips up over their heels and say, okay, now, now we're working with a more vertical structure. So like if you have a, a vase that you're trying to adjust on a table, 
if your table's tipping forward, that vase is always kind of on the verge of tumbling off of the table. So it's a way of kind of writing, writing the table so that the vase becomes more stable just inherently because of the positioning that it's now in. And then once, if your pelvis is way out in front of you, if you imagine if you stand up and really jut your hips way forward, your torso doesn't tend to go forward. Your torso then has to lean back to kind of counterbalance that. So when you bring your hips back, you can't now have your shoulders careening back because now you're more likely to tumble backwards. And then that's when I would have people start, well, now we need to bring the torso or the rib cage down. And now you are, you're more physically stable. So it'd be like, you know, you've got the table fixed and you've got the vase fixed on top of that. But let's say you stack another vase on top. If that vase is tilted backwards, that vase is likely to fall. So you're kind of like stacking blocks. You know, you're stacking all of your joints up vertically so that at rest you're more stable. But also when you do that, you're also playing with the muscular attachments that connect those blocks. And you are moving very subtly the muscles and the connective tissue and the joints into a position that allows you to deal with forces and respond and thus develop your muscles better simply from standing. So when you stand and your feet are, you know, in these stiff shoes and bound together and your hips are relaxed forward and being held simply by your connective tissue and your shoulders or back, I would call that a very passive way of standing, meaning not only are you balanced sort of precariously, you're not using very much muscle to stand that way. So as you make these subtle adjustments, not only are you, you're more uh, physically in a position where your parts are tumbling around less, you're using more muscle simply by standing that way, meaning that you are getting the benefits of engaging in an exercise bout simply by minding your all day positioning. So I, I think that's impactful because I don't think many people are going to start logging four or five more hours of exercise, right? We already, if we've even carved out that hour of exercise or that 45 minutes, or maybe you do two 45 minutes here or there, if you've already carved out that time, that's amazing. But it's very little time given all the time of the day. So these little tips of adjusting your posture throughout the day for not only better balance and reduced risk of tumbling around, you're training. You're physically engaging in this very low grade constant exercise. And the result is a more robust physical structure. And one of the other things I can say about that structure when you're talking about that is so many people will come in and say, well, I've, I've got bad knees and I'm, I'm watching the way they're standing and they're putting all of their pressure, they're leaning forward, like, you know, like you lean back and they're putting so much pressure on their quads and their knees just to walk around. And if they're carrying a little bit of extra weight, then that's even, even worse. And so getting your posture organized first is a great way to make sure that you're balancing the muscles in your legs and your back and your glutes that's holding you up. That work over time gets them stronger and then basically will probably help reduce some of that knee pain. Well, it's so interesting. I would say that most listeners have this understanding that if you went out to your car in the morning and one of the wheels was pointing in a different way than all the other three, or if you got in your car and you noticed that it's pulling to the right or left as you're driving it, like, oh, there's a problem with my alignment. And you have a robust enough understanding to know that if you are to continue to drive your car in this way, you're going to have a premature wearing down of certain parts of the car. It's not, it's not the whole car is not going to fall apart because of it, but you're going to notice that I don't know anything about cars, but you'll be like, you'll notice that, you know, one axle or one strut or one brake or one wheel or two, they're wearing out at different rates than other parts. And, you know, I get a lot of people who come in and like, Oh, I got, you know, I have this bad knee and I'll be like, yeah, or I've got this foot issue. And they're like, it's just, the, it's just, it's old age. My, you know, my, my healthcare practitioner said, it's just, it's just, it's just, my part is worn out. It's like, yes, but that same part on the other side of your body is not worn out. And that automatically shuts down the age as a reason. What it does is it shows you a frequency of use of the way that you're using your body. And so, you know, that you have to take your car in for alignment. Why wouldn't you also be able to put that mechanical knowledge onto your body. It's because we don't think of our body as having as under the same physical laws of all other machinery, but they are. You are responding to pressure and friction and 
and tension, just as any other material. Your tissues are a material, behave differently than wood and metal. But the things that you know about your home, as far as the structure of it and the car, those all apply to your body as well. And that seems pretty radical, I think, to a lot of people. And they're always blown away. Like, I didn't know that you know, my, maybe they have an issue with the front of their foot and they're coming in, you know, for a corrective exercise. Cause you know, I, I need to exercise my foot, but they don't, they're not aware that by having your hips way out in front of you, you are increasing the pressure on the forefoot. Like we don't think of injury as a result of physical loading. We kind of think of it as these spontaneous, just cellular problems. They just kind of erupt with a particular problem. We don't think of inflammation as having roots in physical laws manifested. And so to me, that's really empowering because it's, it's they're quick fixes. They're like, really? I just backed up my hips and now my forefoot or the front of my foot no longer hurts. It's like, well, certainly you've reduced the pressure there. All the things that you're doing by, you know, putting pads under your feet and different shoes, all of those were playing with the pressure of the area. What you didn't know was the way that you were moving is also part of what creates the pressure. So you're going to learn how to move differently. And lo and behold, this thing that you've had for two years or eight years disappears because you stopped pushing on it, essentially, right? Just to take that one step further, one of the, uh, at least one of the examples, uh, ladies in the book, was due to go in for surgery. And based on changing her movement patterns, has not had to have that surgery 10 years later. So um, I think, you know, it does go to say that if you can start moving your body, aligning your body better, you're going to see health improvements. Now, one of the things you talked about in the book, which which was like my favorite, because I, I do this a lot with some of my clients, is is the getting down and getting up. You know, when we were kids, uh, it was nothing to plop down on the on the floor and play or plop down on the floor and, and do this and that. And we even played games like Duck, Duck, Goose, <laughs> which had you getting up and down. We don't play those kind of games as adults. And as a result, we kind of lose some of that mobility and ability to get up and down. With my clients, I had one client specifically I'll talk about. And I took her out and I said, okay, her big deal was she had a granddaughter and she wanted to be able to keep up with her granddaughter. And so I told her, I said, okay, well, and we'd work for, together for a few weeks before I started this with her. But I said, for this weekend, when your granddaughter's on the ground playing, go sit down next to her on the ground, play with her on the ground. And I said, and get up. And I said, you're going to notice that's pretty hard. I said, but I want you to do that this weekend as often as you feel you can comfortably do it. And then the next weekend, and by three weeks, she not only was saying, I'm not having any trouble really getting up and down now because the granddaughter's got a, you know, attention span of, of a gnat and is, you know, five minutes later, it's great. Grandma's there, but five minutes later, she's up going to do something else. Anyway, what she also said was her relationship with her granddaughter was changing. And that's the beauty of movement is, you know, we think of movement as how we've gotten to the point where we believe that movement or we perceive that movement is to facilitate simply more movements. Like, oh, I'm going to do my exercises just so I get to do my exercises again. Like that's, it's become often, it's often prevented that way. Do these exercises for your health, you know, keep your body robust. But because we don't have a lot of things that use movement in our life, like, what are those things for? And so then we have this kind of functional exercise movement. It's like, well, you're exercising so that you can be able, you, it's more self efficacy, right? You can get up and down out of your chairs longer for a longer period of time. You can live on your own for a longer period of time. You can walk through your own home with less risk. So it's all kind of goes back to this idea of longevity to be able to do those behaviors again, but it's seldom relates back to joyfulness, that movement opens doors to experiences that a lack of movement often closes. So your granddaughter is, like you said, she's she's buzzing around, she's coming in and out, she's low, she's not where you are. It's your world is uh, is higher, like physically higher than her. You, you're not even on the same common ground anymore because you are literally at different levels. You know, kids are walking around banging their heads against the tables. They can't even see what's on the table. They can't, they have very little access to your world. And it used to be very, and it is still in many cultures today that everyone's on equal ground. They're all on the floor. There is no, you sit on the floor and you sit on this chair. There are no chairs. And so when, when you are able to get down to the floor, you open up the possibility for exchanges that don't happen otherwise. And it naturally, of course, is it's a changing how you relate to things, whether it's 
wow, I didn't know that under my couch was so dirty, which happens in my house a lot. Or, or it's that I, I have never really looked you in the eye. Like we've never sat soul to soul. We've never sat shoulder to shoulder on your level. You've always had to come to mine. And so I, I feel like there's, you know, a new movement right now talking about longevity that we, you know, through uh, medicine, which is, you know, a form of technology, we're able to, people are able to live longer and longer, but it hasn't necessarily translated into living better. And so how, and movement I feel is the key to that. Like if you can keep up your mobility so that these experiences are, are also happening as we all age, then what a joyful gift that is. Like you're not, you're not only adding, what do I say in the book? You're not only adding years to your life, you're adding life to your years. And and I think that's critical. So if, if we want to start with some ways that we're going to add movement, could you give us just a few tips on how we can get more movement in our lives? Oh gosh, you know, dynamic aging is laden with them. So, you know, like you're, I think that's a brilliant tip sitting on the floor. If other, if there are young people around, but also, just on your own. You know, it's hard to practice getting up and down off of the floor all the time. One of the tools I'll often use is, um, you know, I, I have kids and I'm constantly folding laundry. Maybe everyone is, can you sit on the floor and do your laundry at that time? Or if the floor seems too far away, you can either sit up on pillows or you can simply, a lot of people have ottomans and footstools. And we think about putting our feet on them while we're in the couch. But what if you just use that as your seat a few times a day? You would be using your knees and hips essentially more like you would in a squat exercise to a greater extent, but you're still just sitting there watching TV or doing your laundry or whatever it is that you're doing. We're in the habit of driving through at the bank now. What if you just parked and walked in? You know, that's an old, an age old fitness is park farther But what if you just looked at a few places where you just don't park at all and walk, you just started to drive through and see if, you know, I know it's going to add a few more minutes to your day, but again, it's not only adding more minutes to your day, you're meeting people in person, right? You're, you're engaging in that community and that personal exchange, which is also important for all humans, but person to person exchanges tend to decrease with age, just due to the way our particular society is set up. So sometimes you can blend your more personal exchanges with more movement. And then, um, you know, if you meet your friends for coffee or if you have a book club that you belong to, consider making those activities walking based. You know, can you grab your cup of coffee and then go walk a loop in the park where you're actually, you're infusing movement into areas of your life that right now are non-movement friendly. If you go to your kitchen, a kitchen, we all eat, we all eat multiple times a day. So around your foods, foodstuffs is ripe, if you'll include, forgive the pun, um, for movement to adding more in movement. So one of the things that I've done is move my dishes down low and the things I use daily, like my coffee filters or my tea bags, move them high. Things that I reach for every morning, I just move, I just out of cultural exchange, I have picked up that what's best is to organize everything for convenience sake for as little movement as possible. But then here I am trying to like, I don't have time to exercise more. So where am I supposed to get more exercise? Oh, I can deconvenient some of some of my kitchen. And so now just preparing a meal involves, you know, three big overhead reaches, which suspiciously look like stretches I'd be given by a personal trainer or a physical therapist to improve my shoulder mobility. Now I just use it when I grab my peanut butter, you know, from the top shelf, or I'll bend over to pick up one or two plates, which again, you're starting to put in these stretches and these mobilizing exercises during non-exercise times, simply by getting your life accomplished, right? Movement is life. Those movement has always been what has facilitated the things that you need. And it's only in this recently modern world that we've pretty much gotten rid of it, you know? And so it's just about putting it back in. And those are Those are very simple ways to move your joints differently without having to add exercise time. And like you said, the book, Dynamic Aging, it it is just laden with lots of practical tips. These exercises to really, you know, get your feet uh, better, get your knees and your hips better, just get your balance better, make you more resilient and enjoy the life you have much, much more. So thank you so much for being on the show. If I could uh, send them somewhere, where would you like for me to send them? Uh, nutritiousmovement.com. Well, first, if, if 
I sign you, I would send you out on a walk to your local bookstore. <laughs> if it, you know what, you know, like we're so used to ordering online. It's like, what does the inside of a bookstore look like? I don't know. Is it walkable? Can you park in the farthest parking stall and, and walk in and, um, see if it's there. But if you feel internet is easier than nutritiousmovement.com is a, is a good portal for lots of articles on this matter. Um, and it's a great place to source other things. Like if you like to listen to podcasts or if you enjoy social media, you can get to any, anything through nutritionismovement.com, which is my website. Okay. Well, we'll make sure to have a link to that in the show notes. This is episode 236. So you can go to 40 plus fitness podcast.com forward slash two, three, six, and I'll have all the links there. So Katie, thank you so much for being on 40 plus fitness. Thank you, Alan. I appreciate it. I really do appreciate Katie's no nonsense approach to these things. I mean, uh, wasn't that great? If you enjoyed this podcast, would you please share it with friends and family? Thank you. Next time on the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Denny Cray and discuss running. Until then, have a happy and healthy day. <music>